Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. This conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And I will turn the call over to your host today, Dr. Joseph Breen. Sir, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joe Breen. I'm a program official at NIH in the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. It's my pleasure to be your moderator today for our uh, seminar here, which is uh, titled uh, Novel and Emerging Tick-Borne Diseases, Agents, Clinical Features, and Surveillance Information. We've assembled a panel today of speakers to talk about some of these agents, um, and that panel is shown on the first slide. Um, the way <coughs> that we're going to organize this is each of the speakers has been asked to talk for about 10 minutes on um, one of these novel uh, or emerging organisms. And then we will um, take a few questions online. So we'll have six 10-minute talks, followed by the one to two online questions for each talk. And then to make sure that we get all the presentations in, we're going to move back to the subsequent presentation. Any time we have for the balance, since we're scheduled to go to 1.30 p.m. Eastern, we'll take, continue to take online questions. And in the case where we can't reach all the questions or if there's a question following this session, uh, the CDC has uh, graciously provided an email from the Division of Vector Borne Diseases, uh, dvbid at cdc.gov. And I'll repeat that again at the end um, of the presentation. So my purpose here is to give you just a little bit of context for our topic today. So I have just a few introductory slides, and then we'll get right to uh, the discussion of some of these um, novel and emerging tick-borne diseases. So tick-borne diseases, um, this is a list, actually, that is on the NIH, NIID website where uh, I work as well as the CDC, and the, the websites are actually at the bottom of this slide. So tick-borne diseases, um, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, ehrlichiosis, uh, Lyme borreliosis, and rickettsiosis, including the spotted fever, spotted fever rickettsias, um, southern tick-associated rash illness, better known as star eye, and tick-borne relapsing fever as well as tick-borne viruses, Colorado tick fever, and Powassan, which you'll hear more about today, as well as tularemia. The ones with the stars are actually all reportable to the CDC. Um, and so the others obviously are not, and so in some cases we don't know as much about them. Um, um, for various reasons, they may not be reportable. Um, but the reason I'm presenting you this list is because actually these are all important uh, pathogens and certainly are within the research mission of uh, the NIH um, as well as the CDC. So this slide is actually comes directly from the CDC. So tick-borne disease uh, in the U.S. from as 2012, so these are reported cases. Again, um, total reported cases. For example, Lyme disease, which is um, the highest number of reported cases, 30,000 cases. Um, some of the other uh, that we'll be hearing about today are present on the slide, and then all the way down to Powassan virus, which was seven reported cases in 2012. And it, so, and, and it's also important to note that anaplasm or ehrlichia are lumped together a little bit here, undetermined other uh, 208 cases in 2012. So that's, that's informative, but that's really just one uh, year um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how things may have changed um, over a much larger time span. The other important feature is how do these uh, occur across the U.S. in terms of tick-borne diseases. Another slide from uh, data that's uh, presented from the CDC showing um, some of the major suspects. The Lyme disease, which is, again, a foci nor mostly in the northeast and upper Midwest, but is known to be expanding uh, westward and, and uh, southward and northward in some cases. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is seen here more um, in the, really in the tip of the south in the Midwest, 
and actually all the way up through the East Coast. Um, and anaplasmosis, which has clear foci as well in the upper Midwest and the East Coast. And again, you can imagine that these are related to the vectors where they're contained. But I'm, I'm not going to get into that so much just for this brief introduction. Ehrlichiosis, um, which is contained in a belt um, here in orange, really again across much of Tennessee, east and west of Tennessee, and um, like in here in the in the Midwest as well, as well as up and down the East Coast, and much more rarely to, uh, seen uh, tularemia, but cases still seen, and you can see uh, plenty of blue dots. And I'll remind you that this is um, uh, again not strictly speaking where the disease occurs, but um, where it's reported from uh, the resident of the person uh, who's reporting. So in terms of a, slap shot, a, a snapshot of, um, of disease from 2003 to 2012, this again uh, is from the CDC showing uh, really 10 years worth of uh, surveillance data from, for Lyme disease from 2003 reported cases for 21,000 has really steadily increased um, to 30,000 cases in 2012. With um, it's also the definition uh, changed slightly in terms of confirmed and probable cases, um, which may account for some of the differences in cases. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever or the spotted rickettsia group has um, increased tr fairly dramatically from 1,000 cases in 2003 to over 4,000 cases um, in 2012. And again, the Ehrlichia anaplasma. Um, combination here has really increased from 700 to uh, over 3,700 cases in 20, uh, 2012. And Babesia, which is uh, really not reported until 2010, is in the um, range of approximately 1,000 cases, and we'll hear more about Babesia uh, later uh, in this series. The purpose of this is really to indicate that these are um, the cases are growing in each, in each of these, and now we have some uh, novel and emerging tick-borne diseases that we need to consider uh, as well moving forward. So I would like to then go right to um, the subject matter talks here. So before I introduce Dr. DeVries, I'll just remind you again that what I'm going to do is turn it over to Dr. DeVries. He'll go through his presentation, and then we'll take a few questions. Uh, online and then move on so that we can get through these, uh, you know, interesting uh, presentations and get all our content in, and then we'll come back to final questions at the end. So at this point, I'm going to pull down, uh, Dr. DeVries, your presentation and turn it over to you. So this is Dr. Aaron DeVries from the Minnesota Department of Health. Dr. Thank DeVries, you. DeVries, there you go. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, on behalf of uh, David Neitzel, who's head of our vector-borne disease unit here at the Minnesota Department of Health, um, really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk a little bit about Powassan virus and share some of our experiences that we have had here in Minnesota over the last few years. So uh, as Joe mentioned, Powassan virus is a tick-borne virus, and it was first described in 1958 in a case of fatal encephalitis that occurred in Powassan, Ontario, in Canada. Subsequent work has found that Powassan virus is a tick-borne flavivirus, which is closely related to West Nile virus. And there's at least two unique strains of Powassan virus. There's a lineage two strain, uh, sometimes referred to as deer tick virus, which is predominantly transmitted by, uh, to humans by the black-legged tick, or Ixodes scapularis. And lineage one, a prototype, virus, which is typically transmitted by Exodes kukii, which is often referred to as a groundhog tick, which is usually found in close to burrows um, where it feeds predominantly on medium-sized mammals and rarely quests for hosts more broadly. Now, uh, 
Powassan is just one of many known human pathogens transmitted by the black-legged tick, which is likely responsible for the majority of Powassan disease that is observed in Minnesota. And I just show you this list because um, some of what I'll be speaking to about the uh, areas of risk is really based on surveillance for some of these other uh, black-legged tick, tick-borne disease. In the U.S., Powassan disease has been identified predominantly in the upper Midwest and the Northeast based on uh, really reports of neuroinvasive disease, and uh, as I'll discuss in a little bit, this is probably just one of the uh, larger uh, features, a larger number of types of illnesses that may occur in the context of Powassan disease. Now, a uh, typical black-legged tick habitat is characterized by a dense forest canopy as imaged here with thick underbrush and a layer of rotting leaf litter on the forest floor. And the ticks spend most of their time uh, in the litter and they come up to quest for hosts near the ground level uh, at times when the environment is sufficiently humid, and humidity is a very important predictor of this. In Minnesota, there's uh, really four major biomes, and three of which are, are dominated by forest, and one is, is grassland, grassland being in the western portion and southwestern portion of our state. And black-legged ticks are commonly found in all of them, really with the exception of the prairie grassland, which is largely agricultural and typically too dry to support ticks. This is uh, our, uh, uh, a map of our risk area of tick-borne disease. And as you can see, it overlaps very closely with these forest forested biomes. And this is really based on our reported Lyme disease in human anaplasma over this uh, period of time from 2007 through 2011. In recent years, as Joe mentioned, uh, Minnesota has experienced an expansion of the endemic areas of tick-borne disease, especially in the northern and northwestern uh, portions of Minnesota. Now, the, our uh, Powassan was first identified in Minnesota in 2008, and through 2012, we've identified 21 cases. Now, based on our interviews with Powassan cases, trying to understand a little bit more about where exactly they were exposed um, in uh, the month prior to their onset of illness. Um, the areas here highlighted in red are the uh, counties in which Powassan cases um, appear to have been exposed. And if you overlay this with the uh, areas of highest Lyme disease uh, incidents, you see that these areas overlap very closely. Um, and this is really consistent with our thought that the disease likely shares the same vector. Uh, in 2000, since 2009, we've identified Powassan in, uh, in Exodes scapularis ticks by PCR in all of the five counties where ticks were collected and tested over this time period. And depending on the year and the location and the tick life stage, infection prevalence for Powassan virus ranged from anywhere from zero to up to 15% of ticks. Now thinking about a Powassan disease and its manifestations, similar to West Nile virus, Powassan can cause central nervous system disease, particularly encephalitis and meningitis. And this has been observed in up to 10 to 15% of reported cases um, of which, I'm sorry, of 10 to 15% of, of the cases reported have been noted to have died. And of those who do survive, long-term sequela is actually quite common, uh, being observed in about half of those individuals. I think importantly, though, the clinical spectrum of Powassan virus is not fully known, and some infections may certainly cause either just a, a febrile illness or may, in fact, be asymptomatic. Powassan has only rarely been identified uh, in, in all of North America with an estimated around 60 cases. Um, however, they feel that there's very likely substantial underdiagnosis, likely because uh, the diagnostic testing isn't widely uh, available. Diagnostic testing uh, really uh, has been based on uh, serology for the most part. Powassan IgM and IgG based on ELISA or uh, plaque reduction neutralization, neutralization testing. 
um, as well as PCR of serum and CSF have really been the mainstays for the diagnosis of these individuals. And currently there are very few laboratories in the U.S. that offer Powassan virus testing um, on clinical specimens. Uh, we offer it here at the Minnesota Department of Health. We're aware that the New York uh, Department of Health uh, offers this as well as uh, the Division of Vector-Borne Disease uh, at CDC. Uh, of our 21 cases that occurred between 2008 and 2012, our peak year was 2011 with 11 cases. Almost all of our reported cases have had encephalitis or meningitis, including one death. We have had two who had a febrile illness only, and really we feel that this is very likely uh, biased due to the nature of the surveillance and how these cases were reported. The median age has been 49 years with a, median, with a wide range, and almost all of our cases have had onset between the months of May and August. The cases we've identified are likely biased, um, as I mentioned, um, and really because we have a number of surveillance uh, mechanisms, uh, one of them in particular focusing on unexplained critical illnesses and the other related to unexplained uh, encephalitis. Of individuals who have had neuroimaging uh, within our experience, out of these eight individuals, seven of them have had an abnormal MRI, with the majority having abnormal midbrain lesions, and again, in our experience, most frequently within the thalamus. So despite the relatively low reported human number of cases, Powassan virus has likely increased in prevalence over time. Um, this is uh, data from a study of Powassan antibody among white-tailed deer in Connecticut uh, over the years of 1979 to 2009. And there was a consistent trend of increasing prevalence of antibodies against Powassan virus that was observed. And you know, this is very consistent with uh, what we believe is the same trend that's likely occurring in Minnesota. You know, despite yearly variation in our case counts, and cases of tick-borne disease transmitted by black-legged ticks continue to rise in Minnesota. The incidence of human anaplasma doubled from 2000 through 2006, during which time Minnesota ranked in the top three states for disease incidence and represented one quarter of reported U.S. human anaplasma cases. Since 2000, cases of, of Lyme disease, human anaplasma, and human ehrlichiosis, as well as Babesia, in the state increased 170% from 546 cases in 2000 uh, to over 1,400 cases in 2010. One important difference that impacts public health recommendations related to Powassan disease prevention is that the tick attachment time leading to transmission of Powassan is likely less time than other tick-borne diseases. In this study looking at infection time in mice, an attachment time of 15 minutes led to 63% of the mice becoming infected. And if you compare that with Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, Babesian anaplasma, where there's approximately 24 hours uh, or, uh, or more that is typically required for that transmission. So in summary, um, be aware that Powassan may be occurring in your state, um, and uh, I think it's important to think about raising awareness among your medical community um, if, uh, as this is a, a potentially an important um, uh, disease, particularly if you have uh, black-legged tick uh, disease activity within your state. I think one of the reasons why Minnesota has been able to detect a number of these cases is that we have uh, a couple of different programs, which I mentioned. One of them is uh, a program for unexplained critical illness and death reporting. This has actually been a very important uh, mechanism that we've heard about many of these individuals. Um, Powassan is likely causes a wide range of clinical manifestations, but clearly has a strong association with neuroinvasive disease, particularly midbrain lesions. And most Powassan disease, particularly in Minnesota, is likely the result of transmission from the black-legged tick, and disease frequency of black-legged tick-associated diseases increasing in Minnesota, as is, it is, as is elsewhere. 
So this likely will result in increasing Powassan frequency. I think it's also important that the application of tick repellent appears to be more important in the prevention of Powassan uh, in comparison to regular tick checks because of the time of transmission is likely uh, as short as 15 minutes. Um, and uh, at this point, I'd be happy to answer any, uh, I guess, a couple of questions. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, this is Joe again. Um, we actually don't have questions that have come in electronically. I'll remind um, attendees that they can uh, ask questions online, and we'll go through them after each uh, speaker as we have time. And then at the end, we should have a, a, some time available to go through remaining questions. So um, we've had a lot of people join, actually, in the last uh, 10 minutes or so. So, Aaron, there aren't any questions right now. Maybe we'll just have to table that until uh, the end when more people have uh, joined and had a chance to ask questions online. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd like to move now to Dr. Roger uh, Nashi from uh, the CDC, who's going to talk about the Heartland virus. Let's see. Uh, I'm online, Joe, waiting for my slides to come up. Okay. There we go. Very good. Yeah, All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is give you a brief introduction to a newly discovered pathogenic virus in the United States uh, that all indications suggest that it's a tick-borne zoonosis, hence its inclusion in this symposium. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that uh, the credit for all of the work I'm presenting goes to a very large group of people that I'm listing as the Heartland Virus Investigation Team um, that came together quickly to craft all this together. And that team consists of four CDC branches representing two divisions, uh, the Heartland Regional Medical Center in Missouri, that was the clinic that treated the first patients, uh, and hence the source of this virus name. The Missouri Department of Health, of course, uh, collaborators with USDA and with, the, with Missouri Western State for many of the field studies that were done, and of course the patients, residents, and the landowners that, uh, that permitted access to do these investigations. Uh, what I want to cover in the next few minutes is uh, some background on the discovery of the virus, uh, some information about fleboviruses, and then some of the continuing activities that are going on related to the epidemiology, the transmission ecology, and the virology of this, this newly detected pathogen. Um, the, the discovery and the identification of Heartland virus is described in a 2012 publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the front page is shown here. It, it's, a, it's an elegant and a really thorough piece of work that I can't do justice to in about 10 minutes. But I will try and give you a sense of some of the events that led up to the discovery of the virus and some of the technologies that were applied. In uh, June of 2009, two adult males, uh, ages 57 and 67 years old, were seen at hospitals in the, the northwest Missouri region. Uh, both patients were relatively healthy uh, prior to this onset of illness, although one reported a five-year history of type 2 diabetes. Um, both presented with similar symptoms, including fever, fatigue, anorexia, and diarrhea. Uh, and their laboratory uh, tests demonstrated abnormalities that included leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. Epidemiological investigations showed that both were residents of northwest Missouri and lived in, a rel in relatively rural areas located north of Kansas City. And if you look at the larger map, uh, the, um, the location of their residence is shown by the pins, and the general region is shown in the inset map. Uh, both were farmers uh, who spent considerable time working outdoors. Um, both reported multiple tick exposures prior to their illness, and uh, neither had recent travel vaccinations or other illnesses that could be attributed to this onset. Both patients, patients because of their continuing illness, were admitted to hospital and received doxycycline for suspected ehrlichiosis given the symptoms that they presented with. However, neither of the patients responded uh, to the antibiotic therapy and their parameters worsen, worsened for, uh, for both of the patients during their hospitalization. Thrombocytopenia became more significant and moderately elevated liver transaminases developed during the course of their illness. Uh, laboratory testing was negative for potential causes of disease, including ehrlichiosis, and they were discharged after 10 to 12 days of hospitalization. One recovered completely within a month, and the second patient uh, reported persistent fatigue and symptoms over the course of a year. 
Uh, the clinic that where they were hospitalized was participating in a CDC study uh, with, with the uh, rickettsial zoonosis branch and a long stu long-standing study of ehrlichiosis. So as a part of the study, acute blood samples from both patients were sent to CDC to culture for Ehrlichia chaffeensis. Uh, both of them showed cytopathic, cytopathic effects on culture in DH82 cells, uh, the, the typical cells that are used to culture Ehrlichia. Uh, however, the morulae that are characteristic of Ehrlichia were not seen in those cells. Um, but similar cytopathic effects were seen when the, the uh, samples were, were inoculated into Vero E6 cells. A subsequent investigation with uh, um, the CDC's pathology branch uh, using electron microscopy identified bunny virus-like particles, which are shown in the, uh, the black and white insert in the upper right, and then follow on with the uh, with uh, biopsy samples, uh, immunohistochemical <coughs> staining detected the presence of the virus in bone marrow biopsy from one of the patients shown in the color insert in the lower right. Uh, both of these uh, these images are, are in the uh, the manuscript that I cited earlier. Now, in 2011, uh, next generation sequencing was used in the viral spe special pathogens branch to further characterize the virus, and it was identified as a member of the genus Flebovirus within the family Bunyaviridae. Uh, however, it was noted that the sequence was distinct from other known Flebovirus. <coughs> To transition now to a little bit about flebiviruses, uh, the, the novel flebovirus belongs to the virus family uh, Bunyaviridae, and Bunyaviridae consists of five genera, Hantavirus, Nirovirus, Orthobunyavirus, Flebovirus, and Tospovirus. Uh, previously, all of the known human pathogens in the Bunyaviridae in the United States belonged to the genera Hantavirus and Orthobunyavirus, a Sinombre virus, which is is uh, very well known now as a member of Hantavirus uh, genus, and lacrosse virus, Jamestown Canyon virus, uh, several other California surgery viruses, and Cache Valley virus are members of the genus Orthobunya virus. But the flebovirus genus contains more than 40 viruses, and several of the better known pathogenic examples are shown here and include Rift Valley fever transmitted by mosquitoes. Sandfly fever, uh, transmitted by sandflies, as the name implies, and severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome virus, recently discovered in China, that's a, uh, a tick-borne virus. Now, there are other tick-associated flebiviruses in the U.S. Uh, Lone Star virus, Sunday Canyon virus, Rio Grande virus are, are viruses that have been identified, but they are not known to be pathogens. Uh, the Heartland virus is shown to cluster in a clade uh, with, the, with the SFTS virus. And that's demonstrated uh, in this uh, phylogenetic analysis uh, that was done in the McMullen paper, the this initial paper I'm still discussing, showing that Heartland virus is most closely related to, to SFTS virus, though it's not a particularly close relationship, as so, shown by the degree of difference in the amino acid sequences of the nucleoprotein and the polymerase uh, proteins in this phylogram. I'd like to shift now to some of the follow-on studies that have been put in place to obtain more information about Heartland virus. Uh, one of the first things that we worked on was developing and optimizing diagnostic tests that would be needed to conduct the various studies that, that were needed to follow on. Uh, these included developing an IgG ELISA, um, validation that we can do a neutralization test, a plaque reduction neutralization test in Veros E6 cells to provide confirmation tests and virus-specific RT-PCR assays to detect and identify Heartland virus RNA, which is proven useful in, uh, in detecting virus in acute human samples and then in some of the other uh, investigations I'll be mentioning shortly. An epidemiology study was initiated to look for additional cases and to get a better description of the clinical disease presentation. It's now in place in six hospitals in Missouri. Uh, so far, approximately 50 patients meeting the case definition have been recruited and tested for Heartland and Ehrlichiosis. A few suspect Heartland cases have been identified, and we're continuing to work them up, and several Ehrlichiosis cases have been found as well. Um, the diagnostic test protocol uh, that's been approved by the IRBs is available to patients outside of those six hospitals, but because it's still experimental enrollment in the study is required, so if there's interest in doing this, uh, contact your state health department uh, we've been in communication with the state health departments about the study, and um, there should be an, an awareness of how to contact folks here to get through to them. 
Um, Heartland Antibody Sera Survey using blood donors is starting this fall uh, in the Northwest Missouri region to provide some additional evidence about the prevalence of infection in this community. A number of field and laboratory studies have been put in place to describe the Heartland virus transmission cycle. Uh, in, in one study, blood samples were obtained from a large number of vertebrates, uh, mammals, and birds in the vicinity of the initial patients. Uh, antibody against Heartland virus was found in horses, dogs, and raccoons. And we're following up by examining additional species and expanding the geographic range of the samples to, uh, to get a better uh, picture of where this virus is located and being transmitted. In one of the studies, uh, the groups also collected a large number of ticks in the vicinity of the case residences. Um, the most commonly collected species was the lone star tick, Amblyoma americanum. So this appears to be one virus or one pathogen that's not associated with, uh, with deer ticks in the U.S., at least so far. Um, and in this study, uh, Heartland virus was isolated from lone star tick nymphs. Um, this, this graphic shows the geographic range, roughly, of the lone star tick. Uh, so this is the reason why we're looking more broadly at the geographic distribution of Heartland virus in the environment. Our, the results from that tick study were just published in the Journal of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene this, this month. Um, the map shows the location of the collection sites with the virus positive sites circled in red. And the phylogram at the right shows that the viruses are isolated from the ticks are very similar to the viruses isolated from the human cases two years previously. And then also shows the clustering of that virus with other tick-borne flevoviruses. And we're continuing to examine other ticks, mosquitoes, and sandflies as potential vectors in the field. And we're working on projects to describe the vector competence of Lone Star ticks in the laboratory. Uh, finally, what I want to point out is that we've developed a web page with general information about Heartland virus. And as uh, more studies become published and more information is gathered about the clinical presentation, the disease burden, and the transmission dynamics, uh, we'll be updating this page as we, uh, we accumulate more information. And uh, I'll stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Roger. Um, <clears throat> we don't have any questions yet from this presentation. We actually had one that came in a little bit after we um, – Turned it over. Uh, it's regarding Powassan. Aaron, if you're, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Um, maybe we'll take this question now. It's fr since it's from your presentation. It's, it looked as if the brain lesions were asymmetrical. Is that common with Powassan neuroinvasive disease? Uh, again, these are very small numbers, both in our experience and a few other published instances that, yes, they're often asymmetric. Um, the images that I showed you of the three cases uh, were all asymmetric. However, I, I, I think it, there was at least one or two of them that did have involvement in both sides, um, but uh, they often had more involvement in, on one side compared to the other. Okay, great. Uh, another question just came in, um, again, about uh, Powassan. Is there data on the seroprevalence of Powassan? Um, there are data, as I showed, uh, regarding seroprevalence in animals. I am not particularly aware, and maybe others are on the call are aware, of uh, data uh, looking at human seroprevalence. To my knowledge, I, I, I'm not aware of, of broad uh, data looking at uh, a large populations of humans looking for right. prevalence. I'm not either, actually. I'm more familiar with, I mean, there have been a number of studies looking at adult ticks, but not uh, human seroprevalence. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Roger, for your presentation. So we may collect questions, as has happened for the first presentation. Um, but at this point, I think it's best we move on to um, Dr. Peter Krauss from the Yale School of Medicine is going to tell us a little bit about Borrelia miyamotoi. Okay, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. you. Go. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Joe and Ben, for inviting me to speak about uh, human Borrelia miyamotoi infection. Um, this is a, a recently discovered um, uh, Borrelia. Um, 
I'm going to present uh, some slides initially on the, on the history of, of the discovery of this organism and then uh, proceed through to talk about epidemiology, uh, clinical manifestations, diagnosis, and treatment. Uh, Brillia miyamotoi is a relapsing fever spirochete first discovered in 1995 and exited hard-bodied ticks. The first re, uh, report of human Borrelia miyamotoi infection was published more than a decade later in 2011. Two types of relapsing fever have been recognized in humans uh, for a long, long time, uh, louse-borne relapsing fever and tick-borne relapsing fever transmitted by soft-bodied ticks. Louse-borne relapsing fever is caused by a one species, a single species, Borrelia recurrentis. It's transmitted by the human body louse from human to human. It can cause uh, epidemics and death in areas with crowding and poor sanitation. And during World War I and World War II, there were millions of cases and uh, actually estimated millions of deaths as a result of louse-borne relapsing fever. Um, it does have a worldwide distribution, but currently is endemic only in Ethiopia and Sudan. Tick-borne relapsing fever, uh, that is that uh, transmitted by soft body ticks is caused, more than, caused by more than 10 species of Borrelia. It's transmitted by ar argicid uh, or soft body ticks to rodents and humans. It has a worldwide distribution, and it's relatively uncommon in the United States uh, with about 500 cases reported between 1990 and 2011, primarily in the western states. Um, Borrelia miyamotoi was first discovered in 1995 by Fukunawa and uh, colleagues. They described a new relapsing fever, Borrelia, in uh, Ixodes persulcatus ticks in Japan. They named it Borrelia miyamotoi after Kenji Miyamoto, uh, who's a famous, uh, world-famous entomologist. Uh, this discovery greatly expanded the potential range of relapsing fever infection from regions enzootic for soft-body ticks and lice to regions enzootic for hard-body ticks. The genome of Borrelia miyamotoi uh, has been sequenced, and it clearly belongs to the relapsing fever group of Borrelia rather than the Lyme disease group of Borrelia. The, this is, these are slides showing the organism. Um, this is uh, work of uh, Dr. Alexander Platinoff, uh, and um, he uh, isolated. These are isolates from uh, blood in patients. You can see the, the, blue, uh, the blue dots are actually uh, white cells. And um, there's a, a phase co contrast uh, picture in the in the center. Um, and um, the two the ticks that transmit tick-borne uh, relapsing fever are shown here. Uh, soft ticks uh, transmit the majority, but hard ticks now have been are with the discovery of Miyamoto I, Hard ticks now uh, are transmitting one species. Um, in 2001, Skulls and Fish and others described Borrelia miyamotoi and I scapularis ticks in Connecticut. This was the first discovery of the organism outside Japan. And then um, in 2009, Barber and Fish described B. miyamotoi uh, in hard body ticks and in white footed mice in 11 northeastern and northern midwestern states and concluded that B. miyamotoi likely will be present in ticks wherever B. burgdorferi is found. And this prediction has been confirmed in the northeastern and western United States, Central Europe, Central Russia, and in Japan. The first report of Borrelia miyamotoi infections in humans was in 2011. These were 46 cases from Central Russia that were confirmed by PCR and antibody. And there were a few blood smear positive uh, uh, findings in, uh, several case, in several of the cases. Um, in 2013, there have been four reports so far of human Borrelia miyamotoi infection that have been published. The first uh, gugliata uh, described uh, and, and colleagues described meningoencephalitis due to Borrelia miyamotoi in an 80-year-old immunocompromised patient from New Jersey. And in the same issue in New England Journal, our group uh, described uh, seroprevalence and clinical manifestations of Borrelia miyamotoi infection in residents of southern New England and New York. Uh, Chowdhury and colleagues uh, then described two cases of Borrelia miyamotoi presenting as human granulocytic anaplasmosis from Massachusetts and New Jersey. And Hovius uh, recently described in The Lancet uh, a meningoencephalitis case due to Borrelia miyamotoi in a 70-year-old 70, 70 immunocompromised patient from the Netherlands. Um, the ecology of um, Borrelia miyamotoi is summarized here. Uh, it's transmitted by hard body ticks from mammalian reservoirs mammalian reservoir host to humans. 
Um, the average B. Miyamotoi infection rate in I. scapularis ticks was found to be 1.9% in, in the Barber study with a range of 1.1 to 10.5%. And that compares with uh, a rate of in, uh, uh, in ticks of Borrelia burgdorferi of 19% with a range of 2.6 to 35% in the Northeast and Northern Midwest. Um, interestingly, um, Borrelia miyamotoi is transmitted both transoverally as well as transdotally, which uh, means that infection can be transmitted not just by nymphal and adult ticks, but by larval ticks as well. And this, of course, lengthens the, the transmission season. Uh, the geographic distribution of human cases is shown here. Uh, cases have been described in the United States so far in Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island. Uh, in Europe and the Netherlands, and in Russia, in Central Russia. Uh, we uh, are going to talk a little bit more detail about the study that we did. Um, following the initial discovery of um, uh, Miyamoto I in humans, we decided to try to determine whether this infection was occurring in humans in the United States, and we, uh, we decided to uh, test archive sera for antibody to this, to this agent. And, um, uh, the methods we used, we used a recombinant, we created or made a recombinant B. Miyamoto I antigen, GLPQ, which is glycerol phosphodiesterase. This is an enzyme uh, found in relapsing fever Borrelia, but not in Lyme disease Borrelia. Um, so we developed the GLPQ antigen based ELISA and Western blot uh, for a two tiered approach, uh, as is similar to that used for Lyme disease testing. Uh, we tested three different groups of subjects, healthy adults that participate in sero surveys. We do annual sero surveys. have been done, doing that for the past 20 years at study sites, um, uh, primarily Block Island, uh, uh, Rhode Island. Um, and uh, patients come in, uh, they get free antibody testing for Borrelia and Babesia, uh, and we um, then uh, save their sera have about archived now about 10,000 sera over the years. And uh, so we t t tested a subgroup of those sera uh, for Borrelia miyamotoi. We also had a group of patients with acute Lyme disease and a third group of patients who had summertime febrile viral-like illness, not Lyme disease. I'm sorry. So the results were that sera from 18 of 875 um, uh, subjects, that is 2%, were Borrelia miyamotoi positive, seropositive. Six of 584, 1% of healthy adults in southern New England were, po were positive. Uh, nine of 277, that is 3.2% of patients who had Lyme disease. And three of 14 patients who had, uh, that is 21%, who had summertime viral-like illness. We've subsequently done more, um, more um, testing of sera, and that 21% that is We've tested a lot more, many more patients with summertime viral-like illness, and that percentage is down to 3%. Um, so that was just a, 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 due to the small number of cases that, that we got that high percentage. Um, <clears throat> so we also demonstrated or found seroconversion, that is a fourfold rise in the antibody titer from acute to convalescent sera in three patients, two of whom were co-infected with Borrelia miyamotoi and, and Lyme disease, and one with uh, Borrelia miyamotoi disease alone. Uh, or infection alone, all three had a viral-like illness with fever. The clinical manifestations, when one looks at the 46 cases from Russia and then the subsequent cases that have been described in the United States and, and the one case in, in the Netherlands, um, all have a viral, present with a viral-like illness. They all virtually all have fever. Um, they're the, common, the most common findings are fatigue, headache, muscle aches, chills, and nausea but one also can see sweats, nausea, vomiting, cough, sore throat, and adenopathy. Now, 10% of the Russian patients had relapsing fever. 10% of those 40, that is five of the 46 Russian cases had relapsing fever. And these were patients who experienced uh, one or two bouts of fever before seeing their physician. And then when they did see their physician, they were either on their second or third um, episode of, of, of febrile illness, um, and uh, they were diagnosed and treated. Uh, the other 90% of cases uh, with the first fever, patients were seen by their physician. They were diagnosed to have this disease, and they were treated 
uh, as we'll talk about later with either ceftriaxone or doxycycline and their, uh, their fevers uh, results. So we think that it's likely that if pa patients are not treated, the majority would develop relapsing fever. Uh, again, only 10% in the Russian cases, and those, again, were in people who did not seek a physician's help with their first bout of fever. Um, <clears throat> we also know, there was also noted in the Russian cases that 10% had an either erythema migrans rash or an erythema migrans like rash, that is a rash that didn't quite make the five um, uh, centimeter diameter uh, requirement, but there, there were erythema migrans or erythema migrans like rash noted. Uh, it wasn't entirely clear, although there was some, there was an attempt to rule out the possibility of co-infection with Lyme disease with uh, antibody testing. Uh, it wasn't clear whether these patients might have had co-infection with a, a, a Lyme Borrelia agent, a Gorinii or Spilei, uh, that might have accounted for the erythema migrans rash. So I think rash is a possible um, uh, finding with um, Miyamotoi and, and possibly not will require further research to determine that. Um, neurologic complications, as we've seen, have been described in two patients, meningoencephalitis, um, and these were in older immunocompromised patients. Uh, it remains to be seen whether will be whether this will be observed in immunocompetent patients. Um, I, what I'm going to do now is just uh, in the next two slides compare the diagnosis of Lyme disease with Miyamoto eye. Um, both, of course, rely on, in part on uh, epidemiologic information. A patient needs to have either traveled or lived in uh, or resided in an area that's endemic for these diseases, or that should be part of the part of the diagnosis. Um, the one looks for uh, typical symptoms in these patients. Um, physical exam is extremely important for Lyme disease because most of the cases are made on the basis of the erythema migrans rash, whereas with Miyamoto eye, most of the cases, or perhaps none, uh, present with, uh, with a, uh, a rash. And the, the illness, again, is a sort of a nonspecific viral-like uh, febrile illness that can be mistaken for many other uh, potential, uh, many other infections, and so laboratory testing becomes really important. The laboratory diagnosis is based on, um, uh, for Miyamoto, I apologize for that plus sign being to the right there, but basically uh, blood smear is a, is a useful diagnostic tool for Miyamoto, I, not, not really for Lyme disease. And uh, the, the number of spirochetes in the blood is uh, both uh, high and sustained with relapsing fever uh, Borrelia. Uh, it appears to be uh, that, uh, that appears to be true for Miyamoto eye as well, though the spir at least initial data, data would suggest that the spirochetemia is not as, as intense as some of the other relapsing fever Borrelia. Uh, nonetheless, uh, one can visualize the organism on blood smear, and that should be part of the diagnostic workup. The sensitivity and specificity of that test is, of course, not known. We know that with relapsing tick-borne relapsing fever, non-Borrelia Miyamoto eye relapsing fever, uh, as much as many as 50% of patients may be positive on blood smear. Uh, polymerase chain reaction PCR is useful for diagnosing both diseases, especially Miyamoto eye. Small rodent inoculation and culture, of course, are, are, are really um, confined to research labs, but uh, one can take a tenth of a cc of blood, inject it into a a skid mouse, and um, uh, one can, uh, if one then sees it in the mouse, you made the diagnosis. Um, one can culture Lyme disease, the Lyme disease Borrelia. Miyamoto eye has been successfully cultured, that is the Japanese isolate uh, or isolates, but um, uh, so far isolates from the United States have not been uh, successfully cultured. And antibody detection is, is useful for both, uh, both in, uh, diagnosis of both infections. Um, this shows a uh, slide, um, uh, a thin blood smear of a patient with Borrelia hermsii, and you see the the red uh, uh, erythrocytes, and then these sort of, uh, and then the numerous uh, abundant uh, spirochetes on this slide. And this is a very intense spirochetemia that one wouldn't always see with hermsii, uh, or uh, or certainly Miyamoto eye, but uh, usually a lot fewer spirochetes in this, but it does demonstrate that they can be visualized on peripheral blood smear. Uh, the treatment of uh, Borrelia Miyamoto eye is doxycycline. Uh, it's the same as Lyme disease, essentially. Doxycycline, 100 milligrams every 12 hours. 
uh, by mouth for 14 days, or ceftriaxone 2 grams uh, once a day IV for 14 days. Um, and these were these were the antibiotics used in the Russian cases. They were quite successful in in, in clearing the infection and uh, and resolving symptoms. Now in the Gugliotta case, uh, they started with they started treatment with ceftriaxone, and the patient had a Yerix Herxheimer reaction, and they switched to penicillin G, 24 million units IV once a day for 30 days, and that was effective. So um, in conclusion, this is a Borrelia miyamotoi is a newly discovered uh, infection, um, and uh, its health burden remains to be determined. Um, I did want to thank the many co-investigators who've uh, been involved with our work, and um, there are many of them, and certainly our funding sources, the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Gordon and Lura Dunn Foundation. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, there are a couple questions uh, that came in. I, th I think we'll just take one now to, because we're a little bit uh, off time. Um, have any studies described transmission effectiveness with tick attachment time for Borrelia miyamotoi? Uh, no. Uh, the, the, in the, actually, I, I should revise that. The, in, the, um, in the Russian studies, um, there was information on that, and um, actually, the, the, you know, in comparison with the other uh, uh, tick uh, transmitted agents, um, I mean, basically, they, in, the, in those, those cases, there, there was a history of tick bite within the previous week, but really to understand, or there was no data really to uh, determine uh, what the, how long the tick needed to be attached before transmission occurred. Okay, thanks. Hopefully, we'll have time at the end to get to a few more of the questions that came in. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. So um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer McQuiston from the CDC, who's going to talk about Ehrlichia muris-like organisms. Good afternoon. While we're waiting for the slides to be pulled up, um, I will just say thank you for having me on. And like Dr. Nashi, I would just say that um, none of the data I'm presenting here today is really my data. It's really um, information that has been provided by other people or through published literature. So um, we'd just like to uh, thank them for, for the assistance in pulling this presentation together. So orlichiosis and anaplasmosis are both reportable diseases in the United States, and you've already seen a map that shows the relative distribution. But what I would like to point out here is just that for, um, for the United States during 2008 to 2012, these are the parts of the country that really had the most cases reported for orlichiosis and anaplasmosis. So for Ehrlichia, we're talking the um, kind of southern, midwestern to east coast United States. And for anaplasmosis, it's going to be the northeast and the upper midwest. This graph shows the number of reported cases of ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis during 2008 to 2012. And you can see that we have uh, between 3,000 and 4,000 cases reported um, during 2011 and 2012, if you look at all of these uh, numbers combined. But relatively speaking, we have more reports of anaplasma phagocytophilum than we do ehrlichiosis cases. In 2009, we had an unusual occurrence in that a confirmed case of ehrlichiosis was actually found in Wisconsin, which is a part of the country where we have not frequently seen confirmed ehrlichiosis in residents who have not traveled out of state. This particular patient had onset in June. He was 51 years old, and he presented with a fairly typical uh, tick-borne-like illness with fever, headache, myalgias. And he was suspected for tick-borne illness, and acute blood samples were sent to Mayo Labs for PCR testing. He also experienced lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, and elevated liver enzymes, which is quite a typical um, profile for suspected tick-borne um, illness patients. Mayo used a multiplex PCR test. Uh, which differentiates Ehrlichiosis, particularly Ehrlichia uwingii and Ehrlichia chaffeeensis, from Anaplasma phagocytophilum based on melting point curves. And what they found in this patient was a completely unexpected melting point curve that seemed different than known um, Ehrlichia and Anaplasma species at the time. 
And they sent samples to CDC for confirmation, and sequence analysis confirmed that there was a novel Ehrlichia species causing this patient's infection that was similar to Ehrlichia muris, and that in this talk I will refer to is E. muris-like, as the um, species determinations have not yet been made for this organism. This is a graph that kind of shows Mayo's multiplex PCR assay and the melting point curves. And you can see that the EML agent falls somewhere between Ehrlichia euingii and Ehrlichia chapiensis in terms of its um, melting peak. After the index case was identified, um, a little more attention began to be paid, and Mayo subsequently identified four more cases of this EML agent infection in uh, two more residents from Wisconsin and one more resident um, from Minnesota during 2009. Like the index case, they all had fever, fatigue, headache, and lymphopenia. Um, if you combine them all together, three of the four had thrombocytopenia, and one had elevated liver enzymes. Interestingly, two were prior transplant recipients, um, and they were on immunosuppressive therapy at the time of their infection. All patients reported exposure to ticks in wooded areas, and you can see a picture here of one of the case patients' homes. It looks a lot like that picture you saw in an earlier talk of typical um, Ixodes scapularis habitat for the upper Midwest. In addition, out of the three patients who had sera that were actually tested on commercial uh, ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis assays, three of the three patients showed stronger reactivity to Ehrlichia chaffiensis than to um, anaplasma phagocytophilum. Sequence analysis showed 98% uh, sequence similarity to E. muris, and at the top of this picture you can kind of see where the new Wisconsin species fell out. Um, and this phylogeny was based on 16S ribosomal RNA genes and the grow al heat shock protein operon gene. From 2009 to 2012, I'm sorry, this uh, is cut off at the top, but there have been 22 EML cases diagnosed in Wisconsin. On this slide, the cases are mapped by county of residence rather than exposure, with the exception of the STARS. Those represent EML cases diagnosed in out-of-state residents, um, and the STARS are in the suspected county of exposure for those particular patients. In addition, from 2009 to 2012, the EML agent has been identified in 20 uh, case patients from Minnesota. And you can see the distribution here really closely follows the map that Aaron showed of um, Ixodes scapularis uh, born infections in Minnesota. So it's sort of that, that, wooded, um, that wooded biosphere within um, Minnesota. This particular map shows cases based on county of possible tick exposure rather than county of residence. And from 2009 to now 2013, so this is adding a year on to the data for the state-specific data that I just showed you, Mayo has collected information on 63 cases of the EML agent. Um, all of these are PCR positive. It includes 58 cases in Minnesota and Wisconsin residents and five travel-acquired cases. Some of these cases represent the ones that were reported in Minnesota and Wisconsin's um, um, general summary, but there are some additional cases in 2013 that kind of represent new cases. 63% of these cases were male. The mean was 60 years of age, and they ranged from 23 to 87 years old. 90% presented with fever and a majority had headache and thrombocytopenia, and lymphopenia was also reported in 57%. The majority of cases were not hospitalized, about 23% were, and um, all that received doxycycline treatment were responsive um, to, to that antibiotic. Interestingly, Mayo has also done extensive testing of specimens from other states, and among 11,000 specimens tested from states other than Wisconsin and Minnesota, they've not found evidence of EML among any of those except in travel-acquired cases. Um, I do want to just, uh, again, I apologize, the slide got shifted when it was uploaded, but Diagnostic testing is a bit of a hot mess for the EML agent right now. Um, and serology-based surveillance is kind of difficult to interpret in Minnesota and Wisconsin. We know that EML cases cr 
cross-react with commercial Ehrlichia chaffiensis assays. And the evidence says that they do not react well on anaplasma phagocytophilum assays, although I think most physicians in Minnesota and Wisconsin currently rely more on anaplasmosis testing than they do ehrlichiosis. But for those patients that are tested for ehrlichiosis and have positive titers, these may represent EML cases, even though the only commercially available assay is to each chaffiensis right now. Because of this difficulty right now, PCR is the recommended way to diagnose EML infection in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And if serology is being used to diagnose suspected tick-borne illness in these states, we recommend that providers request both anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis serologies. Um, and I'll also say that an IFA test using the EML antigen is in early development, but I don't anticipate that being um, something that's rolled out anytime soon. A few additional published findings. Um, DNA from the EML agent has been detected in 3% of Ixodes scapularis nymphs and adult ticks from Minnesota, and also in nymphal pools of ticks from Wisconsin during 2009. Um, and of other ticks that have been tested to date, EML agent has not been found in any other tick species. In addition, a retrospective look at Ixodes scapularis ticks collected from the 1990s in Wisconsin showed that 1% contained DNA from the EML agent. Um, and there's also been a single case report of emurus infection, which is presumed to be the EML um, organism, in a dog from Minnesota. Um, from Sandor Karpathy in the CDC um, Environmental Ecology Group here, he's provided some preliminary data on some of the laboratory studies that they're doing with the EML agent. And we can report that it is highly pathogenic in C57 B6 mice. 90% mortality is observed with uh, 10 to the third genomic copies and 40% mortality at um, 10 to the two genomic copies. In addition, when you feed Ixodes scapularis nymphs on EML-infected mice, uh, those nymphs retain infection after molting, and they can go on and transmit EML to naive mice, suggesting that it is a competent vector. Tick transmission results in 60 to 70 percent mortality in mice, and it looks like that mortality occurs 10 to 13 days post-exposure, which is consistent with some of our understanding for other Ehrlichiae pathogens. There's also some evidence that co-feeding transmission may occur, meaning that if you feed infected, infected ticks next to uninfected ticks, uh, the infection can pass to those other ticks. And then preliminary data um, on DNA samples that have been collected suggests that DNA has, is highly conserved among all uh, samples tested to date, but studies are ongoing. And these studies will help inform decisions whether this represents a new species or not. And then finally, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. This is my contact information. And as I mentioned, uh, strong acknowledgments belong to Bobby Pritt at Mayo, who was the uh, scientist and researcher who found the first EML case and was the uh, primary author on the New England Journal paper reporting these first infections. Dick Johnson and Dave Neitzel from the Wisconsin and Minnesota Departments of Health. And then CDC staff, William Nicholson, Marina Aramiva, Sandra Carpathy, Cecilia Cato, and Scott Dahlgren. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Great. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, there is a question, actually. Um, I'll read it for you. Does the data on lab mice suggest any morbidity or mortality in natural rodent populations attributable to this bacterium? So by natural rodent populations, I'm presuming they mean paramiscus species? Or am I misinterpreting the question? Mm, that's I guess we'll have to interpret it that way. I think right now our only experience is with these laboratory mice, and it's highly pathogenic. But I think in the, the wild rodent species, we would likely expect to be serving as possible reservoirs. I don't think that we have any data yet to inform that, inform that answer. Great. OK. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. That, that was the question. More may trickle in, um, so we may come back, actually, to you. So at this point, I'd like to move again forward to our next uh, presentation, which Dr. Barbara Herwald, uh, also from the CDC, who's going to tell us about Babesia microti. 
Thank you very much. And as my slides are being uploaded, I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is a real privilege. And uh, let's see here. We can get to the first slide, or sh um, should I back it up, Joe? Why don't or? you? Yeah. Okay. I'll just give folks a heads up also that, as Jennifer mentioned with her presentation, some of mine might have uh, gotten messed up. I got uploaded. Let's see here. Um, not sure if I'm. We can get back to the beginning We're here. Getting there. We're getting, there we go. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that, folks. I'm going to touch on principles and perspectives. This is not going to be a primer about babesiosis. I'm going to touch on multiple topics. In the United States, again, this is an example of a slide in which the formatting got a bit messed up, but I think uh, we'll be able to read through it. Uh, this is a potentially life-threatening zoonosis caused by intraerythrocytic Babesia parasites. And the predominant etiologic agent is Babesia microti. I'll be mentioning other agents later. It's transmitted by ticks, but also is transmissible via transfusion and occasionally via congenital routes. And tick-borne transmission is seasonal and regional. For B Babesia microti, the tick-borne transmission is occurring in evolving foci, and I want to underscore evolving, it's changing over time in the Northeast, especially parts of New England, New Jersey, New York, also Pennsylvania more recently, and perhaps some other locales, and parts of the upper Midwest, parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin. And a lot of us take some of these areas for granted, but it's been over relatively recent past that some of these states have been added to the map, so to speak. So again, I want to emphasize the dynamic nature of this. And in fact, in the next slide, it's one of the purposes to emphasize that the risk for zoonotic transmission for Babesia microti and also other agents is dynamic in time and place. And we have to keep in mind the various factors, the parasite. And by the way, I'm referring to it as Babesia microti as if it's one organism, one species. There may be strain differences that are relevant, but I'm going to oversimplify a bit in this talk. And of course, the tick vector is important as our reservoir host. The first convincingly demonstrated U.S. case of babesiosis, believe it or not, was documented in California. It occurred in 1966. Of course, there may have been many other cases in people before that in the U.S., but the first convincingly demonstrated case was in the western U.S., and even now we're not sure what the species was. The first reported case in the Northeast occurred in 1969 on Nantucket Island, and that case was caused by Babesia microti. And by the way, whenever I mention years, it's the year of occurrence. In January 2011, Babesiosis became nationally notifiable, and most of the people participating in this symposium know the distinction between being notifiable and being reportable. And Babesiosis is reportable in 21 states, that's as of 2012. And in round numbers, CDC has been notified of about 1,000 cases per year since it became nationally notifiable, again, but in these states, so not in every single state, it's including confirmed and probable cases. And the fact that in 2012 the number was slightly lower does not in any way, of course, mean that babesiosis is going away. Uh, not only is there underreporting, but there can be real differences, as folks in the symposium know, from year to year in terms of tick populations and all the many different factors that contribute to whether people become infected, let alone have their cases diagnosed and reported. 
In terms of clinical aspects, again, focusing on principles and perspectives, the infection can range from asymptomatic to severe, and both ends of the spectrum are very important. I'll mention a bit later why the asymptomatic end of the spectrum is important. The severe end of the spectrum, I don't have time to go into in any detail today in terms of the complications, but again, as I already mentioned, this can be a life-threatening disease. But regardless of how severe a case is, the manifestations always are nonspecific. There are no pathognomonic signs on physical examination. Nonspecific viral-like symptoms are common, such as fever, and then on routine laboratory examinations, you know, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, et cetera. But people can be afebrile. And some of the manifestations, such as hemolytic anemia, sometimes are relatively subtle. But because the manifestations always are nonspecific, diagnostic testing always is required. And the symptoms usually develop within several weeks, sometimes months of the exposure. And when I say sometimes months, that can be because of delays in diagnosis. It also can be because of host factors. For example, someone might have asymptomatic infection and then have their spleen removed and become symptomatic at that point in time. Risk factors for severe babesiosis include asplenia, advanced age, and the other age extreme, prematurity, and various other causes of what I'm loosely referring to here as immune dysfunction. Again, I'm oversimplifying matters. To emphasize the importance of the spleen, I just want to have this slide to underscore it in your minds. It's incredibly important to have splenic function, and people who do not have a spleen are at particularly high risk for this as I said uh, repeatedly, potentially life-threatening infection. I'm not going to talk about treatment aspects right now, but I do want to underscore this is a treatable infection, but if it's not caught soon enough uh, or if, if there are complications, multi-organ system dysfunction, et cetera, again, uh, the person can die. Now, tick-borne transmission can lead to transmission via transfusion. And tick-borne transmission, we've already talked about the fact that certainly there have been thousands of cases. I mean, even ignoring at the moment the fact that babesiosis was not a notifiable disease until recently, um, it, it's very clear that there have been thousands, probably nowhere near the numbers of cases of Lyme disease and I don't have time to get into the many differences between babesiosis and Lyme disease. There are similarities, but also differences. But when we think of sort of the log scale for tick-borne transmission, we'll have like 10 to the third cases overall, meaning thousands. Uh, and transmission via transfusion, more than 160 cases have been documented. And that's over time. Uh, the first documented case was in 1979. But transmission via transfusion, which I don't have time to uh, talk about in detail today, is of great concern in terms of blood safety issues. But why can tick-borne transmission lead to transmission via transfusion? Well, even persons who, are, who have asymptomatic infection or whose symptoms resolve may have low level subpatent, meaning not demonstrable on blood smear exam, low-level parasitemia for weeks to months, even longer than a year. How long? Well, we don't know how long, uh, and we don't know how often people who seem to be otherwise healthy have persistent or relatively chronic infection. And we don't think it's lifelong infection, uh, but Infection has been documented in some people for more, as I already said, more than a year and maybe even more than two or three years. And this subpatent parasitemia, low level, again, not demonstrable by blood smear exam, sets the stage for transmission via transfusion 
and protracted infections, that's the stage for year-round transmission. So you can have a transfusion-associated case even, in, the, for example, in winter months. And people can meet all of the current criteria for donating blood despite being infected and infective. To date, no Babesia donor screening test has been licensed, but there are many investigators and many agencies who are working on developing and evaluating donor screening tests. And as some of you know, in some of your states, in fact, donor screening is being done under FDA-approved IND protocols. I want to briefly touch on principles related to laboratory evidence of infection. First of all, thinking about people, not blood donors, people who are symptomatic, who have acute cases of infection. In those people, Babesia parasites typically can be detected on careful review of blood smears. And I underscore the word careful, and also the need for someone experienced who's looking at the blood smear. And sometimes more than one blood smear may need to be examined. And so if the diagnosis is being considered, manual or non-automated review of blood smears should be requested explicitly. Now, frankly, often the diagnosis is serendipitous, even in people who are very sick and even in people who have high levels of parasitemia. Now, blood smear exam, parasitologic diagnosis, blood smear is a classic means of parasitologic diagnosis. Of course, it's important to differentiate from malaria and also to differentiate intraerythrocytic structures from how jolly bodies you might see in someone who's had their spleen removed, also to differentiate structures from uh, artifact. So it's not always easy to examine a blood smear. Animal inoculation is another means of classic parasitologic diagnosis. It's available just in reference laboratories, for example, at CDC. Some of you might not have realized that there's no culture technique available for Babesia microti. There is for some of the other Babesia species, but not for Babesia microti. And I'm putting the molecular techniques I'm lumping them for now under parasitologic diagnosis. Uh, and when I speak of PCR, I'm, again, just doing it in very broad strokes. I'm not getting into any of the important differences and, and the new advances with PCR. Serodiagnosis can provide supportive evidence for considering that someone has babesiosis, and there are various serologic techniques. Again, I'm not talking right now about donor screening. IFA, uh, indirect fluorescent antibody testing, has been the gold standard for diagnostic testing uh, over time. And there are different assays for different species. Immunoblot, um, there's a B microti immunoblot available uh, not through CDC, but through a commercial source, uh, and various agencies are working on developing and evaluating EIA tests for donor screening as well as diagnostic purposes. I think I want to underscore the general point of considering the diagnosis of babesiosis if indicated, particularly but not only in people who have fever and or hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia, but also to question the diagnosis if it doesn't seem to make sense or if, again, things just don't quite add up. But we're here to help, and of course, uh, you folks in state health departments and local health departments also often have experts who are very experienced with the diagnosis of babesiosis. You're also probably very familiar with DPDX, which is a diagnostic, telediagnostic service that's offered by CDC. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to help uh, do various types of testing for babesiosis and also to look at blood smears and to differentiate babesia from malaria. Now, for diagnostic testing, again, I want to underscore big picture. Diagnostic testing is very different than donor screening. The point of this talk is not to get into what donor screening tests or approaches should be used, but again, just to underscore the differences and that 
again, if we think about lab approaches, parasitologic or molecular techniques, of course, are to detect the parasite or DNA. And that's great because it, that would determine that someone has active infection. But even PCR, again, this is in broad strokes, is not sufficiently sensitive to reliably detect low-level infection. A positive result from a good lab is great, but for example, in a blood donor, a negative PCR result would not exclude the possibility of infection or infectivity. Serologic techniques, again, in broad strokes, highly sensitive except early on in infection, but not uh, techniques that, at least at the moment, reliably distinguish active from past infection. I also want to touch briefly on the fact that babesiosis can be caused by novel parasites that are not detectable by serologic or molecular tests for Babesia microti. And since the 1990s, sporadic Barbara, Barbara, yes? I'm sorry, I have to interject. Um, we're going to run out of time here shortly. Um, can you bring it to a... Yes. Okay. Sporadic cases have been caused by various agents, including Babesia duncani in several western states. B. diversions-like agents in various regions, if not B. diversions sensu stricto, an unidentified, excuse me, unnamed agent in Tennessee, and we don't know much about these organisms. And B. duncani, for example, is morphologically indistinguishable from B. microti but not detectable by serologic or molecular techniques. And there have been less than 10 B. duncani cases that have been parasitologically confirmed. They're very important cases, but it's important to emphasize that the threshold for considering a IFA result positive has not been well established, given that relatively few cases have been parasitologically confirmed. And so much remains unknown about this parasite, but be cautious when interpreting lab results. And I just want to close with mentioning the fact that, again, for transfusion-associated cases, most have been caused by B. microti. Three, in fact, have been caused by B. duncani. Most have been associated with red cell components, several with whole blood-derived platelets. And again, the incubation period can range from weeks to months. And I've already mentioned, I'm closing with this, that because of the potential for protracted infection and also donor travel and uh, interregional shipments and distributions of blood, you can have transmission anytime, anywhere, but that's not to imply equal risk. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Appreciate that. So um, there aren't any questions actually for this presentation specifically. We do have a a number of questions that are, are collecting. But at this point, I'd like to move to our final speaker of the day, and that is Ana Perea from the CDC, who's going to tell us about tick-borne disease prevention resources. OK. Here you go. Great. So I'm Ana Perea, and I work in the Bacterial Diseases Branch of the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, and today I'd like to talk about the educational and communication materials that CDC has made available for healthcare providers, public health practitioners, and the general public. CDC felt that there was a need to provide tick-borne disease resources to support healthcare providers, including physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and nurses. We began developing materials for these groups based on surveys of provider practices, common questions that we received from health departments and health care providers, and direct input that we began receiving at conferences. These different types of information have proved valuable in developing practical educational materials. The most comprehensive tool we've developed is the Tick-Borne Diseases of the United States Reference Guide. It contains a wealth of general information about the major tick-borne diseases you'd find in the U.S. Each disease section contains information about incubation periods, signs and symptoms, general lab findings, lab confirmation, treatment, selected references, and key caveats about each disease. This is a really great tool, and we think you'll be pleased with it. The other thing that we've tried to do is leave space where local health departments can put their own contact information. 
Currently, the manual is only available for downloading or printing from the web, but we hope to have it available for order online in time for the 2014 tick season. So please check back uh, to the website uh, frequently, and we will um, hopefully have that available by spring. Another item we have developed in response to questions about serology are Lyme disease testing flowcharts. The chart on the left describes the step-by-step -step process involved in two-tiered testing for Lyme disease. The second chart describes the effect of prior probability on false positives in non-endemic areas. These are to be used primarily by the clinician to aid their own understanding of the concepts, but can also be used as a handout for patients who need in-depth information. They're available at the CDC website for download at the URL shown here. CDC and Medscape currently collaborate to develop expert commentary videos at no cost. To date, they've made over 200 videos together. Our branch has participated in this program several times over the past year. The first video explains the proper use of two-tier testing for Lyme disease. The second video describes the appropriate limited use of PCR testing for Lyme disease. Most recently, we developed a video describing the differences and similarities between Southern Tick-Associated Rash Illness, or STARI, and Lyme disease. Other groups within our division have produced videos on repellent use and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which have come out in previous years. Additionally, the Rickettsial Zoonoses branch just produced a video about tick-borne Rickettsial infections among travelers to Africa. Overall, the amount of information gained from these videos is more than worth the minute it takes to sign up for a free Medscape login account. So we encourage you to give this tool a try. Additionally, we've been developing and refining Lyme disease and tick-borne disease webinars, which are available for credit. The Clinician Outreach Communication Activity Call, or COCA Call, highlights the epidemiology and clinical features of Lyme disease. Credits available through the end of the calendar year for physicians, nurses, and health educators. And most importantly, this particular educational program is free. Next, for the mobile listeners out there, we've got a podcast that talks about educating and talking to patients about tick bite, bite prevention. And I know this is a kind of a weird conversation for healthcare providers, so this might give them some tips on talking about prevention. And at two minutes, it's a short, sweet little tool. Finally, I'd like to get talk for a few minutes about materials for the general public. We've developed a number of resources for public health practitioners to distribute to the general public. These are found on the CDC Lyme disease site. Today, I'll focus on the items available in the Lyme disease communications toolkit. We do encourage you to explore the website as it's constantly being upgraded with new frequently asked questions, statistics, Lyme disease stories, and more. One quick note, if you'd like to be notified of changes to the site, click the update <laughs> link circled in blue above, and then you can sign up for Gov Delivery Services for Lyme and other diseases. So that way you'll be notified when new things come out. One of our most comprehensive printed materials is the newly updated Lyme disease brochure called Lyme disease, What You Need to Know. These can be viewed online, saved or printed as a PDF, or ordered in bulk from the website. Next, we have a multitude of fact sheets which provide similar information but are targeted to specific groups. All are available in Spanish and English, and some are available in Portuguese. We've also got three items targeted to children. The first, bookmarks, have been a spectacular hit. These can be ordered directly from the website. The other items are designed to be printed and used by health teachers, camp counselors, or others as needed. Um, we've got a crossword puzzle, and as you can see, we also have a comic encouraging, especially young boys who don't like to shower, um, to do so. We've got the Lyme disease communications trail sign. Um, they're available for order, or you can print a PDF directly to post at a trailhead. Many parks and rec departments have ordered these. And finally, before we wrap up, I'd like to highlight a service that CDC provides, which enables you or your partners to directly mirror CDC's web content. Each web page from cdc.gov can be syndicated 
or made available to outside entities who'd like to share the latest content with their readers. Most of the LAN content's already available, but if it's not, it can be requested. And one benefit of using syndicated content includes having accurate, up-to-date information that mirrors CDC content. Another benefit is that updates from CDC automatically push to the syndicated site. So when we update our information, yours is updated effortlessly. Again, you can do this with any disease that CDC has web pages for, not just Lyme. So I'd like to thank you at this point, and if you have questions about the materials presented here, you can contact CDC info or the, use the email that Joe had uh, posted earlier. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Anna. I'm going to put that slide up with email. So <laughs> we're running out of time, so there are a number of questions, and we'll respond to those questions, but it will have to be after this uh, talk. And if you have follow-up questions that weren't addressed, you can also send them to the address here, dvbid at cdc.gov. I want to mention that this uh, entire presentation will be archived and available, but there will be a delay because the transcription needs to be performed and checked. Um, so you can check the uh, CDC website for the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, and it will also be available at the NIAID website as soon as the transcription and services are available. So thank you, everybody, for your presentations and for your participation today. And we've reached the bottom of the hour, so I believe I'll, I'll need to close and thank everyone again. Thanks, everybody, for participating in today's conference. You may all disconnect at this time.